Hello, everyone. I'm your host, April Hanna, and this is the Path 11 Podcast. Just a reminder, we are offering access to all of our archive shows, which is well over 100 hours of content, and new bonus shows such as the Virtual Book Club, Food for Thought Friday, and the Two Minute Tuesday, all for just $3.99 a month. Think about it, guys. That's less than the cost of a pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. Sign up for premium for just $3.99 a month. Now let's get to this week's show. Okay, so for today's show, we are going to be speaking about life and death and possibly life after death. And we haven't actually talked about this topic in a while. So we are going to be joined with David Roberts, who is a licensed social worker. And he became a parent who experienced the death of a child when his daughter Janine died of cancer on 3-1-2003 at the age of 18. He's a retired addiction professional and is an adjunct professor in the psychology department at Utica College in Utica, New York. Dave is also a Huffington Post contributor, featured speaker, coach, and workshop presenter for Aspire Place. Dave has also presented numerous grief and loss workshops around the country and locally since 2008. Welcome to our show, David. Thank you, April. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so obviously I am sorry to hear about the loss of your daughter, and it sounds like that this was obviously, you know, any parent such a pivotal uh, moment in your life, I can only imagine, and you're doing some magnificent work with grief, Um, but I'd like you to kind of share your story with what had happened with your daughter and her journey with with cancer and and how all of that went down for you guys. Well, um... Janine was diagnosed a week after I completed the requirements for my master's in social work degree at SUNY Albany, which I think is in your neck of the woods, April. Um, Oh, yeah. Yep. And um, she had injured her foot, and we had had thought that it was, you know, just a normal foot injury. Um, It didn't respond to traditional treatment, a walking boot or elevation. Uh, her foot continued to, to get bigger. Um, and then around April of, I think it was 2000 and yeah, 2002, uh, they suggested, her podiatrist suggested that they do a bi- uh, MRI. Um, they did the MRI sometime in May. Um, and they found an 8-centimeter undefined mass at the bottom of her foot. When they biopsied it, they found it highly suggestive for cancer. Uh, the diagnosis was confirmed. She had been diagnosed with a sarcoma, which is a very rare form of cancer. And at the time in 2003, I think there were 2,500 new cases of uh, sarcoma uh, diagnosed per year. So it was a very rare cancer and one that I already hadn't seen. And um, we went to Dana-Farber in Boston. Um, they did a consult and they said she had a stage four tumor with bone marrow and lymph node involvement. And um, the five-year survival rate for her particular type of cancer was 10%, which meant there was a 90% chance that she was going to die within five years. Um, So when we got the news, I knew very strongly in my heart and in my soul that I was probably going to be walking a path that um, I I never thought I'd be walking as a parent and that no parent should ever have to walk. Um, she went, underwent eight rounds of chemo, six of which had um, put, her, put her chemo in 80% remission, but then the cancer remetastasized again, and she died on March 1st, 2003, at the age of 18, at home with hospice services. Um, and I can, you know, safely say that um, her death, and I, I've been no stranger to loss April. I've experienced loss probably since I've been five years old, of, of one kind or another. But the death of my daughter put me in a position where I had to look at all of my priorities, all of my values, and I had to decide which priorities and values are going to change, which ones are going to stay, and how am I going to learn to live in a world that I knew was going to be markedly different without the physical presence of my daughter. Um, and that's in a nutshell for you know for the last 14 years of my life. Yes, and I mean... 
I guess one one of the most profound things I think about your work, um, the books that I've read that you've written, um, Morning Discoveries, um, During the Holidays, you have a guide to help families navigate through grief mm-hmm. towards healing, and then also about the loss of a pet. And um, there was a section in the book of the uh, morning discoveries during the holidays where I really was able to feel your strength about how do you move on after the death of a child, you know, and I'd like you to kind of speak a little bit about how you have been able to be so resilient, you know, is it because you've experienced so much loss in your life? Um, Is it part of, you know, just the coping skills and being a social worker that you've, you know, what you had to do, but um, you've really have, it's, it seems to me that you've been a person that took s- such tragedy and I'm sure it's still hard every day, but you're still living, you're still uh, contributing, you're of service to people. And how does a parent do that after the loss of a child? Well, I mean, I think each parent's path, April, is, is unique. Um, but I, I think there's a few common denominators that I think help parents such as myself um, learn to accept the fact that our world is different. Um, learn to accept the fact that we need to learn how to live, to live differently in a world where our children are no longer present. For me, it was it was a variety of different things. One, I read anything I could get my hands on, uh, particularly memoirs or books written by parents who were longer in the grief journey than I was at that particular time. That I could learn and discover what they what they did to help them to help them get through their grief. I think the second thing was having support. Um, I found a very great uh, parental bereavement support group in my area where it was composed primarily of parents who had experienced uh, the death of a child. And when you're, you're, you're in a group of individuals with experience like loss, you realize that, one, you're not alone. You can share your pain freely and openly without having to to justify or justify why you're doing it. Um, And the other part is that our shared pain became a gateway to each other's hope. You know, we just, you know, through our pain, we were able to discover compassion. We were able to discover, discover, um, you know, a, a light and a passion to do service with, with, and to be of service to other individuals who have experienced catastrophic loss. And I think the other thing was also realizing that though my daughter wasn't physically present, the relationship with her was continued to be ongoing and continued to be strong. And being open to the fact that our loved ones can communicate um, their presence at any time as long as we are open to it and we, we ask for it, it will happen. And it may not be on our own time, because, as you know, spirit time tends to work a little bit more, a little differently than than time in the real world. But they are they are there. Um, and I learned that, you know, almost immediately after my daughter died. And I was never a firm believer in after death communication or that we survived death because I, I had been a psychology major. I believed in empirical behavior, behavior that I could see and experience with my own senses and so I never really acknowledged the fact that there, there that there could be relationships in a, in a different form of energy. But now my my philosophy is a firm, I think, synthesis of both psychology and spirituality, and it's it's something that um, you know is, is my frame of reference now. And can you speak a little bit more about that? What what have you come to believe for yourself with communication uh, with our past loved ones? And what is what are some beliefs that you hold about life after death? And have you had contact with your daughter since? Uh, yes, and and you know I, she has uh, she has come through to a couple of empaths, and we have communicated um, in that way. Um, the other, the other pieces with this is that she's come through in, in other, other types of signs. Like I, I think immediately after she died, I was walking around, I was walking around a block in my neighborhood and there was a butterfly that just was hovering right over me and just following me. Um, Janine and I love music. And so whenever I heard a song that we both enjoyed and when I was thinking of her, um, I knew she was, she was with me. Also numerology. I see a lot of threes and I see a lot of ones. Janine died on March 1st and she died on March 1st 
And so I'll see three ones or one threes, particularly around days that are um, are particularly significant leading up to our anniversary day. Um, there's there's been other things, um, you know, loose change, pennies. Um, I mean, I, I can go on and on. Um, and also when I, I I, I think of her just certain bodily changes, like I'll get uh, chills in my spine. Um, you know that that kind of you know that that kind of uh, those kind of occurrences. Um, and I know that she's a part of me. And kind of what I've done, and you know, the other thing that I've done is the the best parts of who she is become the best parts of me. So I tell individuals that when I'm talking with you, when I'm doing a presentation, when I'm doing a talk, or I'm doing an interview with you, you're getting both of us because you're getting both the best of her and the best of me. And that's how I, I continue to honor the relationship, continue to honor the bond, and continue to work through my grief with her literally being being at my side. Mm. Now, are you um, still married? Oh, yes, I am. I've been married for 35 years. Um, I have two, two surviving children. And, um, you know, our marriage at this is, is stronger than ever. Um, I'd like you to talk about that because I know that some of the stats that I've read about couples being able to maintain their marriage after the death of a child is not very high. Yeah, and, and I think stats are exaggerated, April. Um, okay. A marriage breaks up, and this is my perception, if the marriage breaks up after the death of a child, I, my belief is that the marriage wasn't strong enough to begin with in most cases. In reality, a lot of relationships grow, grow stronger. And it doesn't mean there aren't challenges um, in, terms of, in terms of that. But, you know, my wife and I made it a point to just respect the, and honor the way we grieve, which, which, was, which, which was different. Um, and we also, you know, we're open to, to listening to each other and to talking with each other and to doing whatever we need to do together and singularly um, to, to work through our loss. And, and our relationship, again, is stronger than ever. She's my biggest support with my writing, you know, speaking, teaching, things of that nature. And I can't underestimate the, the role of my students and my, you know, in my, my healing process. Um, I started working at Utica College two months uh, before Janine died. And if it wasn't for my students in that community, they just lifted me up on their collective bootstraps and, you know, loved me when I couldn't love myself. And they, you know, they let me draw off of their energy when I had none to give. And I, I, I owe a debt of gratitude, an eternal debt of gratitude to my students and, and the Utica College community just for their love and unwavering support because I wouldn't be here sitting here talking to you without that as well. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned too that, you know, you and your wife and I'm sure your other children, that everybody does grieve differently. Not mm. not everyone grieves the same. So can you talk a little bit about how people grieve and what are some of the differences? Well, and I always, I'll come across this in terms of kind of gender specific, April, in terms of men and women, because men and women do this very differently. They, we grieve very differently. Um, men typically don't, men, most men don't have a feelings vocabulary. If you asked most guys how they felt about anything, they couldn't tell you because, um, you know, we're taught at a young age to suck up our feelings, suck it up, you know, move on, work through it. So we learn pretty much to deny feelings as part of our vocabulary. Now, if you ask a guy typically what they're thinking, they're going to be able to tell you because we work primarily from a cognitive framework. So whenever I'm working with, a, with uh, I'm sitting or uh, companioning a male who's experienced loss, we go into tell me what you're thinking. And then from there, it may bring up some, some associate feelings. The other part of that is that men and women, I think, feel just as intensely. We just do it differently. Mm -hmm. Women will tend to talk more about their feelings. They are comfortable. Um, they are comfortable receiving support and giving support. Men, most men are not comfortable with giving support or receiving support. If you see a man at a support group meeting with their wife, they may, and I, and I can speak from my own frame of reference. First time I went there, I said, I'm here to support my wife, when in reality, I needed it more for myself. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a different type of grief expression, but yet we still grieve as intensely. The other thing with men that tends to get overlooked, we pride ourselves as being the protectors of our family. So any 
um, expression of emotional pain on the part of our loved ones reminds us that we didn't do our job to, to protect our family, and we take their pain literally. It reminds us. It may remind us of the fact that, geez, our my job as a father was to protect my daughter, to protect my son, and seeing my wife and my kids in pain re remind me that I didn't do that. So. Um, the feelings are that the grief is just as intense for men and women. It's just expressed differently. Um, and as long as as couples can understand that, look, I'm grieving just as hard as you are, but doing it differently and are willing to witness those differences, the relationship will grow. Excellent. Thank positive. you. Either yeah. Uh, there's a line in, in your book that I love. And it says, the grief journey is never linear, but it is always circular. Yep. And I was like, oh, my God, that is such a great soundbite. That is perfect. Yes. I mean, you just, I was like, that wraps it up. And what I really um, enjoy in your book, too, is that you really give per people permission to continue to grieve, you know, that mm -hmm. there isn't this process. This isn't, it's not something that's just going to take a year and you're going to get over it. That you acknowledge that, you know, with, with, with loss in general, especially with people that we love, that there's there's a level of just always having that, that sadness, you know, yeah. that you can still move on. You could still move forward. Um, but it will always be there with you. And I do see in working with my clients as well, that it, it definitely is circular when you think about coming into the holidays, anniversary dates. I mean, dates take such precedence. I, I believe in the grieving process because there are so many memories wrapped around Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays, yep. anniversaries. Yep. Um, you know, it's almost like you can go through the whole year and be triggered throughout the whole year with different dates, different months, different holidays. Yeah, absolutely. And also for individuals like myself, families like myself, who had a child die of cancer. There's other significant dates. It might be the, the date of diagnosis. It might be the, the date where they stop treatment. Um, there's a variety of different different dates that also are, are milestone dates in addition to the ones that we routinely acknowledge as milestone dates. And, and that's, and, and also if, you know, if, if a, a good friend of, of, a, of, a, of a child who has died ends up getting married, that it could be 15 years after a loss, it's still going to bring up those, those feelings of sadness and longing for the surviving family members. So it's always a circular journey. I think over time, you learn that it's it's part of the deal of grief, and you just learn how to manage it better, and it's not as, as overwhelming. You just learn how to manage it and realize that joy and sadness kind of coexist for the rest of your life. Yeah. And you also um, add a nice little poem here that I've never read before. It's called The Elephant in the Living Room by Terry Kettering. Yep. And what a great poem to really address the discomfort of the elephant, quote unquote, the elephant in the room. And how do we talk about it? Do we talk about it? Do we mention the person's name? Um, so did you have any of that experience with friends or other family members about the loss of Janine? And were people, did people not really know how to react or how to talk about her death? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that, and one of the myths of grief is that if we mention the name of the deceased loved one, it's going to, it's going to make, you know, it's going to make us upset. And in reality, we're already upset. And when you do mention the name, you're acknowledging that the person not only if you're acknowledging the person lived and you are inviting parents to share stories and memories of their children and their ability to share stories of their children and the ability of the person who's listening to allow the to allow the the, the allow them to see what they what the parent has lost through the parent's eyes is probably one of the most healing things that can occur uh, so yeah mention mention their name at you know Talk about memories, um, you know. Share a share a, a funny anecdote, whatever. It it's always going to come at a time when it when it's going to be well received and appreciated by by the parent because uh, you know after after the funeral after you know after the calling hours uh, after the after the uh, the meal and you know a month two months down the road people tend to to go to to leave and they tend to forget and they they go on with their own worlds why our world has stopped. And it's typically well after the funeral where the second wave of grief will, will hit will hit because the support's no longer there. So do what you need to do to, to, to mention their names, say their names, and 
allow the parents or the surviving loved ones to share memories. Great. Yeah. And and I'd like to move into one of your checklists that you have in the book uh, when you're focusing a little bit on how the holidays can be a trigger and how it can be yep. hard to get through. Mm. And you have this, this great little checklist that you have and you have put a why next to the things that you want to keep um, yeah. like traditions and things that you can uh-huh. do and then i love that you have put an n for a no next to the things that you can't face this year and yeah. again that acknowledgement of like okay i can do one two and three but there is no way i can handle or even go through this for this holiday yeah. and uh, I, I really i really like that well and i think the checklist is a realistic reflection of where individuals are at at uh, certain points in the grief journey and I tell I tell uh, parents I tell other you know bereaved individuals that I, I've, I've I've talked with that you do what you're capable of doing at any particular time what you can't do you don't just you don't do you can always revisit that at a later time or not um, because I tell them that you know we, the grief journey is is a marathon it isn't a sprint so you don't have to do it all at once and your ability to say no that you can't do things to is also another way that you can learn to take care of yourself and empower yourself. And grief and, and actually loss and catastrophic loss can be very disempowering for a lot of different reasons because we, you know, we play the what ifs, the why questions. There, there might be just un, unspeakable pain and guilt that we're trying to work through. And it's, it's very disempowering. So any little step that... I think bereaved individuals can take to say to empower themselves, I think is going to be helpful, you know, in the long run in the grief journey. Absolutely. And you give really great suggestions too, in ways that people can maintain connection with their loved ones who have passed mm-hmm. during the holidays. And a couple I had never heard of before, and I just want to make mention of them and I, cause I just right. love them and I'm going to give these ideas to some clients too. Um, but I love the one where you had put hang a stocking for your loved one. It can hold small gifts from him or her shopping done by you to each family member. You can also fill the stocking with gifts to be taken to a needy family later that day. I mm-hmm. thought that that was such a great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also really liked at a family gathering, place a decorated box or basket near the door, mm-hmm. ask people who arrive to write down a remembrance on a piece of paper and leave it in there. And then at some point during the day to read those remembrances. And mm-hmm. I thought that that's a great idea, too. I, I love that. It yeah. just gives gives people a different way, um, you know, to still grieve, yet also feel that connection. Yep, and it's, it's it's celebrating the continued bond because, um, you know, and I'm quoting, I'm quoting Maury Schwartz from, you know, who uh, Mitch Album wrote the book Tuesdays with Maury. He said, "Death ends a life; it doesn't end a relationship." And I mean that is so true. The bond continues, the relationship continues, even though the person is no longer physically present. And once I began to understand that, and understand that. A sign just uh, from my loved one just didn't tell me that she that Janine was doing okay, and she, we were going to see each other again. But once I realized that that sign was a greater symbol of the fact of, of her desire to continue to de- an ongoing relationship with me, it took my awareness to a different level. So anytime I get a sign from my daughter, it's like okay, let's uh, we're we're keeping the relationship going, and that's that to me was a. a, a pretty powerful piece of awareness that helped me um, help was one of the many things that helped me get through uh, my grief to the point where now I can I can I can live a life full of full of meaning but at the same time um, realize that um, you know the you know just realize that yeah you know, I'm never going to get over the over the physical loss of my daughter but just realizing now that I can work through it and I can find meaning in spite of it yeah, coming into relationship differently with the consciousness, with the spirit yeah. of the person. And and that it is quite a shift. I mean, I know in my own grieving process with people who have passed, you know, it's the physical is just so nice. You know, hearing their voice, seeing them, touching them, getting hugs, um, visiting with them, eating their cooking, you know, just all those, those things in the physical that yeah. make the physical experience so rich. And to transition to say, okay, now I have to develop this new relationship in a very ethereal type way that I can't, can't, it's not palpable to me. You know, it's like, I can't see, can't touch, can't taste. Um, but yeah, I think that when you keep your eyes open, 
to signs, um, to messages, if you're open to that communication, and that becomes more consistent, and oh. you're practicing that relationship, I think that everyone that I've ever talked to finds comfort and knows that they are yep. still connected. Yep, and, you know, and in the beginning, April, signs can be better spoiled because even though you, it's, a, it's a message from your loved one and they're communicating with you, it's also a reminder that physically they're not here. So right. it's kind of like a, a bittersweet reminder, particularly early in grief. And it was for me. But now, you know, I can say 14 plus years later, when I get a sign for my daughter, it's like, it's a sign of not what I've lost, but it's a sign of what I have right now, which is a, a, a pure spiritual relationship with her, uh, yeah. minus the physical body. And that's something, it took me, it took me quite a while to get to that point. But then again, it's going to take as long as it's going to take for us to get to the raw pain of grief um, to a point where we are learning to embrace a different perspective that allows us to live with meaning and purpose again. Yes. Now, I'd like to take um, a little turn here and talk about animals, yet it is still connected through your daughter with mm -hmm. Bootsy. And the name of your of your books is Bootsy and Angel Books. And yes. And I found a great article on the Huff Post that you had written called Six Pounds of Spirit. Oh, yeah, that's that was about Bootsy. Yes, and that was a great story. And I am also a cat lover. So I and I found the story really miraculous just of the connection, how long Bootsy had lived, the connection with your daughter and you and how Bootsy took care of you and then you took care of Bootsy. And, you know, I just found the story to be awesome and sweet all at the same time. So I'd like you to tell our listeners about Bootsy. Well, Bootsy was, he lived a, lived, lived a very long and very long life of service to, to our family. Um, he died in his 21st year uh, of life on I was it was March 22nd 2016 and um, it was one of the things that had I had struggled with after Janine's death was the fact that I didn't feel like I was a good primary physical caretaker I didn't I wasn't able to um, you know protect my daughter from her cancer or take care of her um, I came to realize after after years of work that my job wasn't to simply take care of her or protect her, it was allow her to make adult decisions, which was to live for her to live on her own terms and, and to die on her own terms. That was my role with her in this incarnation of ourselves. Um, Bootsy reminded me that I could still be a caretaker. He kind of, he was a cat that when, you know, he would get me up um, when I didn't want to get up. He'd get me up at like 4 35 o'clock in the morning and i'd say bootsy come on it's too early he'd start mm -hmm. meowing and he wouldn't let you know he got me moving um he also sat on my lap he showed me love again when i when i couldn't had trouble loving myself and he he that cat was an extension of my daughter and he provided comfort for me and said look i'm going to allow you i've chosen you to take care of me i've chosen you to feed me i've chosen you to to um provide me affection because i think you are worth it i i you know, I, you know he we, we bond that and he reminded me that that there are different forms of caretaking and i think that's what that article was about the other article that i'd ask you to read and this was after one probably one of the Honestly, one of my favorite pieces I think I've ever written, and probably one of my best ones, is Birds in the Rain. I wrote that on March 28, 2016, and it's under my HuffPost author page. And it talks about the aftermath of his death and the amount of synchronicity that occurred um, that told me that, that provided me many moments of peace uh, when you know, my, my sorrow was at its, its, its highest. And then Angel, Angel died, just as an aside, three months after Bootsy. And I think they they came together in our household, even though it was about a year and a half apart. They came together, and I think it was their contract with each other to go soon after each other. Mm. And, but Birds in the Rain is another kind of like, I would say, the follow-up to Six Pounds of Spirit. And that was something that I wrote that came right through me. I think I wrote that blog in about 45 minutes. Um, and... And obviously, I, I did, you know, I, I did some final editing, um, 
but it was um, it was it was a in the aftermath of his death, there was just so many so much serendipity and, and synchronicity that just that involved not only Bootsy but other animals, and, and at the time of his moment of death was just profound. Um, that it was just um, it, it provided me with many moments of peace after his death. Yes. And, you know, you have great articles on the Huff Post. Um, you know, I definitely would encourage the listeners to head on over there. I also read um, the one, of course, eight suggestions for therapists working with yep. grief parents. <laughs> you know, the therapist to me went right there. OK, what are what are some new ideas? And you definitely had some great stuff there for me um, as well. And what I like about your writing and and what you're educating people about grief is that, you know, some of it is review, but I find that I'm constantly getting new ideas from your writings or things mm -hmm. that I have not, you know, read before in the typical, okay, how to help people who are grieving, here are some suggestions. Um, and I think that's because you are really writing from a very personal experience, yep. you know, and it's not just kind of like this textbook thing, one through 10, this is what to do. Well, and, and you know, the thing is, there was an such thing as textbook grief for me after, after Janine died. I mean, any rules that I, I lived by really needed to be broken for me to, to uh, get to the, to the point that I'm at now. And you mentioned, you know, as, as, a, as a therapist, um, anything I knew about therapy or my past training didn't even begin to prepare me for um, dealing with the aftermath and dealing with what I, I needed to deal with personally um, and philosophically after after my daughter died. Um, and so that that article also is a reflection kind of of the work that I've done of with myself and and also what I would you know what I, I would find if I were a client as, as a parent you know who lost a child working with another therapist I would say this is what's going to be helpful to me so right. my, my thoughts about therapy and my perceptions about therapy have changed because of what's happened and with my writing it I try to have it be an honest reflection of where I'm at at, at a particular moment and use what I'm experiencing is hopefully a, a, a point to be able to, to teach or to uh, create some awareness in others who might not have might not have considered a specific perspective. And you know, it's just I I always put things out there and I say, look, you know, you don't have to agree with the specific perspective, but it's just important that you witness it. You know, you take a you take a look at it and then decide for yourself, do you know whether it applies to you or it doesn't. Um, and I think the more we can witness others, others' perspectives and those that are different, um, we become, we become in service to each other more so. I would agree. And, you know, I also really enjoyed reading your other book, um, the morning discoveries, the loss of a pet, because, you know, some people don't have children, but their pets are their babies, you oh, know? Yeah. And losing a pet, if anyone ever has, it's a it's also a very significant loss and not mm -hmm. to be taken lightly just because no. it's an animal. And, and I agree with that. And I think a lot of times uh, pet loss gets I kind, kind of undermined. It gets downplayed. But if you have somebody that does not have any children, that pet is that pet's her child. And a pet is an extension of family anyway. Um, and also the the depend that pet may also provide connections to other people that have predeceased them. I mean, you look at Bootsy and Angel; they Janine predeceased them. So when Bootsy died, you know, obviously it brought up you know feelings, you know, feelings that I had, you know, again for Janine, and the same with Angel because that that was part of the connection with the with the with the two of them. Angel, we found um, she was a rescue cat. We found her. Janine and I found her under the steps of a mobile home uh, in, a, in an area about 10, 15 miles from us, and we took her home. So both of those cats have um, have connections to my daughter. Bootsy was a Christmas gift from her best friend. So both of those cats have indelible connections. And I also think they're all together. You know, they're, you know, they're together right now in the afterlife. You know? Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more, even though I've never met them. <laughs> Yep. I would say they have to be. Um, yeah. And the, the one thing that I just feel is really special about the connection with pets is, I mean, it is just probably one of the first feelings of unconditional love for many people. So, you know, sometimes people have pets before they have children. And like we said, some people don't have children. But, you know, people 
people, even even our children, can love us unconditionally, but we still can experience them getting pissed off at us or yeah. angry yeah. or, you know, just having some judgment towards us, liking yeah. us some days, not liking us other. But with animals, they love us all the time. They, yep. they don't they don't get mad. You know, we so there's like a whole dynamic with animals that we don't experience with human beings. And that loss, um, you know, can be, you know, very deep. And you gave some also great suggestions and tips on how to navigate through, yep. you know, the loss of an animal. And maybe you can go over those as well. Mm-hmm. Um, first and foremost, I think, is to recognize that the loss of a pet is as significant a loss as, as any loss as, as we're going to go through in our life. It's going to have the same, you know, feelings of grief because of the connection that we have have to that animal. Um, I think the second thing is that um, I would, you know, I would say the same the same thing as I would about anything is that the loss of that physical loss of that pet pet doesn't mean the relationship um, with that pet, you know, dies as well. I mean, I, I have. Um, paw prints of both Bootsy and Angel that were were made just before they were they were put to sleep. There are some some owners that will have ashes of their pets that are that are are displayed in their home. So whatever you need to do to maintain the connection, you do that. Um, you know, if you have to if you have to keep their food bowls out for a while, you know, you put those away when you feel you're ready to do that. Um, the other part is if you have surviving animals as well, too, they grieve as well. I mean, when my, uh, when Bootsy and Angel died, our, one of our other two surviving cats, Zoe, um, you know, she started looking at herself. She had a, some anxiety. Um, she looked herself raw, you know, now she's, she's doing okay now, but it was, it was also, that was a loss for them behaviorally. If you see your other surviving animals not eating or not drinking, or they're a little bit lethargic, or changing behaviorally, give them a little extra love as well, too. And don't feel compelled. Somebody will say to you, well, why don't you just get another pet? Well, you, 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 if you decide to get another pet, understand that that pet isn't replacing the one that you lost. That pet is just another going to be another link in the chain of unconditional love and companionship that all of our pets have gotten it, got, given us. So if you're, you get another pet, get it on your own terms. And what I've discovered, April, is that animals kind of pick us as opposed to we picking them. Mm. Um, and you'll know when that happens, and you'll know when the time's going to be right for you to to uh, to get another animal. And you, you know, you do that on your own terms. Um, so I mean, those are just just some of the things that 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 have have come to mind. And and I look at pet losses again because of the unconditional love factor. It is a it is a very significant loss. Is a very significant loss. Yes, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more that our pets pick us. Um, my, I'll tell a quick story of my most recent animal, my cat, Leo. He's an orange tabby. And I was toying around with the idea of getting another animal. And I was thinking about, okay, well, let me get a cat because I do travel. They're a little bit easier to maintain. And um, I took a week and there, there was an adoption clinic and I went and I didn't see anything and I was disappointed. A couple of weeks go by, another one pops up. And I just started praying to my aunt who had passed away. And my aunt always had the coolest animals. I just can't describe it. It's like all of them had such cool personalities. They were almost human-like. So I started praying to her and I said, Aunt Dee, Dee can you please pick me a cool cat? I said, I want, I just bring me to a cat that is going to be awesome and have a great personality and is similar to, um, my cousin had a orange tabby cat named Roger. And he was just like, he'd sit up at the dinner table and, you know, have dinner with us. And it was just like, he was like a little human being but he was just a great cat and my grandmother hated cats but loved roger mm -hmm. so i said i'm only going to adopt a cat if i can find a yellow tabby or an orange tabby that looks like roger and the last adoption clinic that I went to, it was the last cat at the end. Lo and behold, it was a male cat and he was orange and he was so cute. And there's something about just looking in the eyes. And I was like, there he is. Yep. It's him. And I've had him for about seven months now. And he 
is probably all, all of my cats that I've ever owned have had great personalities, but there's something really, really special about him. And I called upon the spirit of my aunt, who was a great animal lover and great intuitively at choosing animals or they, they, them choosing her. And I really felt like she helped me in that decision as well. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, I, and I think that is so true. And, and the other thing that I've, and that, that is a cool story too, because I, I love hearing stories like that because um, it's just, just proves that, um, you know, that it just proves that, that there are some things that happen that you can't explain just through, through physical law. There's sacred laws. A lot of what I think dictates what happens to us, particularly after catastrophic circumstances. It was interesting. I was, as I was, you were talking about Leo, um, it was interesting because in, 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 in the, the article that I alluded to before about after, right after Boots, about Bootsy's death, Birds in the Rain, one of the things I noticed is that Bootsy would relinquish, would, would be kind of training, treat, teaching Zoe, our black cat, how to take care of me. He would, re, he would relinquish my lap. My lap was his and his alone. He would let Zoe go on my lap. He would let her sleep in my bedroom. It was almost like, okay, I, I'm preparing for my transition out of this world into to Rainbow Bridge. I am going to prepare you to take care of my human. And even now, Zoe has a lot of the same, you know, quirks that that Bootsy has. Um, and he, he does he does she has a lot of the same mannerisms. She follows me like Bootsy used to. So I think animals also have an intuitive sense, particularly when there's multiple animals. When they know that they're in their last stages of life, they feel it is their job to train, to be a mentor, be an elder to, to the youngest cat to say, okay, he's your responsibility now. This is what you need to do to take care of him. Um, and, I, and that was the one thing that, that my wife Sherry and I noticed in the transition as he was beginning to, to uh, physically fail. Um, he began withdrawing from his responsibility to me, but teaching Zoe how to pick up pick up the slack. And the other thing, and I know we both believe in, in reincarnation and past lives and, you know, who's to say that sometimes when a cat dies, their soul doesn't reincarnate into another cat that chooses you because right. how many times have you heard people say, well, you know, boy, this cat that, that I found reminds me so much of the cat that, of, of the cat that, that, that predeceased. Absolutely. And it's like, who's to say that, you know, that they they, their soul wasn't going to reincarnate into a different, you know, a different feline form to provide some of the same comfort and perhaps, you know, to, that that has continued. So I, I don't rule out those possibilities either anymore, April, that I don't rule that out. Yeah, I would agree with you. I remember I was at a training um, and we were on the conversations of reincarnation and somebody had asked, well, can humans reincarnate into animals and vice versa? And uh, the teacher had said that it is a possibility, but for the most for the most part, we reincarnate in the form that we have come into the physical yeah. over and over and over again. So mm -hmm. I, would ag I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, all right. Well, as we're starting to wrap up here, the other thing that I'd like to mention are the wonderful resources and links that you have. You have great resources in the books, um, but on your website, bootsyandangel.com, you have great uh, books that you recommend for yep. the death of a child, some inspirational yep. books, books uh, for men in grief, uh, post-death phenomenon, or do we survive death, and then wonderful web links for people to go to. I would say everybody should have your website bookmarked because if any of your friends or family are looking for resources, you could just pull up Dave's website and bam, there you go. You, you have a ton of resources here. So that's really helpful and really great. And, um, yeah, and people can also, I also see that you have your online store and that's where people can purchase your books. They can purchase our books and, uh, Yes, they can purchase our books, and you know we'll we'll deliver anywhere. So, um, you know we'll deliver anywhere in the U.S. and overseas. So it um, doesn't matter. It's just there. We are the the purpose of uh, Bootsy and Angel books is to provide resources uh, and affordable resources for individuals who are grieving. Um, and any of the articles that you know the article links that I post, yeah, anybody can just download them and print them. I just don't have any any ownership. I think the more 
and we can share our collective work with each other, um, the more we can help each other. So um, it's all it's all there to be used as, as anybody sees fit, April. Great. Well, I've enjoyed our our newly found friendship on Facebook, and I'm even happier that we got a chance to speak uh, live over the phone, which is wonderful and just enhancing our, our new friendship. So thank you so much for being a guest on our podcast. I really enjoyed uh, this interview. Well, April, I enjoyed spending time with you, and it was a uh, it, um... I could have talked to you for about another two hours. So I know, I know. Well, maybe we'll have you back on again. You know, who knows um, if you have another book coming out? I have a feeling, in a sense, you might be doing something more with books. I, I kind of get a sense. I don't know if you've been thinking about it, but I feel like you would be a great person to do a, like a compilation of collecting stories from people. Well, I've um, I, I have been told. I have had a lot of people suggest you know, books to me, and I have thought about writing a book, and you're not the first one that has has had that intuitive sense that a book may be next in my future, so I've certainly been thinking about it, it's just determining a direction I want to go, and yeah. carving out some time in between teaching and everything else is to sit down and, and do this. Certainly the collection of, of blogs that I have would be a, probably a place to start, but... Absolutely. Um, but uh, but no, you're, you know, that's something I've been thinking about, and if that comes to fruition or as I get more out of the talking stage and into the developmental stages, you'll be the, one of the first ones I want to know about that. Excellent, excellent. We'd love to have you back. Right. And um, I I enjoy uh, reading your articles on HuffPost, and I'll be looking forward to more of your work. Um, so thanks again, Dave, for being on our show. It was my pleasure, April, and uh, thank you. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that show, and don't forget to sign up for our premium service with over 100 hours of interviews, as well as our new segments such as Two Minute Tuesdays, Food for Thought Fridays, as well as the Virtual Book Club on Thursdays. All of these extra segments are only available for our premium subscribers. Visit the podcast section of our website at path11productions.com to learn more or to start your subscription for only $3.99 a month. If you're not interested in a premium subscription, you can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Of course, you can still catch our latest five interview shows at any time by subscribing to the Path 11 podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and iHeartRadio. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. Catch you next time.